breaking news from the NBA. Joel Embiid has an injured meniscus in his left knee. At this point, now everything comes down to timetable, treatment, how they're going to do it. Uh, there's no real guy's uh, example or like uh, true like information in terms of how long he's going to be out. It depends on how it's going to go. The reality of this is Joel Embiid could, could, depending on what this is, miss months. It could be weeks, depending on what it, you know, how, how they... I, how they deal with this, I just, I can't believe we're at this point now. We've talked for really the last couple of seasons about how Joel Embiid has essentially stayed relatively healthy. And now we're back to this situation again. Huge blow to the MVP race, because clearly he's not playing 65 games. Huge blow to the Sixers as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's disgusting because... I think there was a it was a lose lose situation where there's a lot of people saying he was ducking these matchups. When let's be real, Joel Embiid's never been able to play 65 games. He's even if there was, you know, that that mandate on him from his rookie season, he's just not a healthy guy. He, his body does not allow him to do that. So the pressure of the the mandate, I think, got to him, and now no more Embiid. What? It's going to happen now for the Sixers moving forward and Joel Embiid. Yeah, first things first, to, to talk through what you guys are already saying about just how they're going to handle the injury, always look out for yourself, Joel Embiid, in his camp. Do whatever is best for him. You have to put the Sixers and the Sixers fans on, on ice. Do whatever is best for you. There's so many stories across the league of guys trying to rush back, especially off of meniscus. You can even look at Isaiah Thomas trying to do what was best for the Celtics. And then he went from backing up the Brinks truck to not getting a deal ever and then being out of the league shortly after that. Robert Tom Lord Williams, we just talked about him right before we came on. He ended up getting that meniscus cut out. He was never the same guy trying to rush back and be the team player. Do whatever's best for you, your family, and and protect yourself. But this is a big change in landscape in the East, of course. The Knicks were already playing really good ball. Uh, This is good news for them, the the Cavaliers. Let's just let's just be real. That's how it's going to be viewed from a lot of fan bases across the league, but massive if you're holding an MVP ticket for Joel Embiid. looks like that's going to be done and dusted, but hopefully he just gets back good and he can get back before the playoffs and still potentially make some noise. But as I mentioned, do whatever's best for Joel Embiid. That's number one. Ben Johnson doesn't sound like the type of guy that wants to go in and rebuild the team from scratch. So even though he may have been Washington's number one choice, and a lot of teams' number one choice because he's a great offensive mind. And I said this before on the show. Like It's not like I haven't said this before. I looked at him as the best offensive candidate that was out there. But we don't know what yeah. he's like as an actual head coach. There's a lot more to sure. it. So to me, I look at this and say, Ben Johnson doesn't have the confidence in himself right now to be a head coach. So I don't want him as a head coach. Am I ecstatic about Dan Quinn? No. But this may also be a situation where – Come in, establish the culture. You got to have a good staff in terms of assistants and coordinators around you. The key here is that Washington got the number one general manager candidate in Adam Peters. And we know this, right? If you've got a great general manager that can identify talent, look at the Texans, anything is possible with that. I'm not ecstatic about the Dan Quinn situation, but at least I know one thing. It's going to sabotage the Cowboys, and maybe Micah Parsons is telling the truth, and he's going to leave and follow him to Washington because we'll welcome you, Micah. We'll welcome Micah Parsons to D.C. with open arms if that's the case. All right, we got two weeks leading up to the Super Bowl. We've lost almost some of this week. Props have already been bet up quite a bit. It's going to happen a lot more. This will likely be the most watched and the most bet Super Bowl we've ever had in the history of the NFL. And Brock Purdy has been one of the most polarizing topics throughout this entire year, but especially with what happened in the NFC Championship game, Neil. I'm looking at his passing yards down to 242.5, which is certainly a much lower number than what we had against Detroit, which I think it closed around 274.5. Rushing yards at 12.5. He ran the ball really well against Green Bay and against Detroit. Uh, Do you see this as a game where we can see a similar result from Brock Purdy in the NFC Championship game in the Super Bowl, or will that Chiefs pass rush make things more difficult for him and maybe limit what he's able to do in the Super Bowl? Um, I'm solidly on the under here. I grabbed 245 and a half passing yards as soon as I saw it. Um, You know, both teams have a pass defense in the top five after you adjust for strength of schedule. Um, Historically, there have been 22 other matchups like that in the postseason since 2002. The average passing yards for those quarterbacks is about 218 yards. 
Um, and my own projection for Purdy is like in the 200s, like below 200s. So I, I don't think this is going to be a good game for Purdy. Um, that's not to say San Francisco can't win. I'm, I, I don't. I don't think the two are necessarily mutually exclusive, but um, I am I am firmly on the under for Brock Purdy's passing yards in this matchup. You look at the running backs here, and you know it looks like both of these teams are going to look to really lean on the running back, considering that listen, San Francisco's run defense in the playoffs hasn't been good. We saw you know multiple running backs shred this defense in between the tackles. Uh, you know that the Kansas City Chiefs' run defense all year hasn't been good. I think 23rd against the run. Christian McCaffrey's number for rushing attempts is 19 and a half. Juice minus 120 to the under. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah Pacheco's number is 16 and a half. Actually, juice to the under minus 130 as well. Uh, is that an automatic play for you? Would you do rushing yards instead? Like, how do you attack the running backs in this game? Well, I think you have to kind of go through the storyline of the game in your head, right? So if you think that um, San Francisco is going to be able to get out to an early lead, then they probably lean on McCaffrey more. If they can't, they're going to have to, to figure out something else and they'll probably be used more as a pass-catching back. Um, so I, I, I think that you know, the number is a fair number. I think, I think this is where you might try to look at like a single-game parlay. I'm usually not a big fan of those because the juice is so high. But you know, again, if you if you think that San Francisco can run away with this, then maybe you look at like an alt line, like minus six and a half, or even minus thirteen and a half, and then you think McCaffrey's going to get a lot of work, right? And then you're able to to even look at you know some alternative rushing attempt numbers. You know, the rushing yards is tough because you know we we don't know like how I think the Kansas City run defense is better than it's been given credit for. Um, but I do think the workload will be there, so I'd be much more comfortable looking at the attempts um, and then also adding to that a, a blowout of sorts. All right, we're going to go pitching <laughs> one, two, three. Listen, this team is, is, is deep. It's got a, a lot of young talent. Uh, it's got a lot of young talent that is locked up for a very long time, but – Outside of a couple of guys like Bradish, you had yet you had a lack of depth, and you could see deeper in the season that that kind of bangs you up a little bit. Corbin Burns is interesting. He's a guy that Deck and I and, and Mario we laugh about this every Saturday. We love every Saturday that Corbin Corbin Burns pitches. We call it fade Corbin uh, Corbin Burns that because this is a dude that for whatever reason, he's always going to go over on the hits allowed prop. He's always going to go over the runs allowed prop, but he still wins games. Like, it's, 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 it's fascinating. And I think in that division, that's kind of what you need because I, I really do think I agree with you. I'm not jumping on the Yankees for any futures props, but I got to imagine there's a, a locker room renaissance in New York because if not, it's going to be the most hilarious thing in the world. Uh, Boston made the move with Atlanta not too long ago. They are stacking the middle infield and are going to be a good middle lineup kind of team. You need a Corbin Burns in in order to win this division. I actually really like this move for Baltimore. There were a few other teams I thought were in the mix. Honestly, I thought Atlanta was going to be in that mix because Atlanta's trying to upgrade the pitching but not spend a billion dollars to do it. Baltimore just grabbed one of the better pitchers in the game, a guy that can play through uh, a game where he's given up contact and create a lot of small ball, create a lot of ground uh, infield ground balls. I think that's perfect for how the rest of the AL East is stacked. I actually really like this move for Baltimore. Rob, given this breaking news now, uh, it just feels like things have changed for the Orioles and that organization and the trajectory there where you have new ownership coming in. You now add Corbin Burns. Uh, they're 14-1 to to win the World Series, 8-1 to to win the NL, the AL. Uh, but uh, when, I, when I look at this team, I think of ownership not too long ago and all the young talent they have saying, oh, well, you know, we're not going to be able to keep all this. So just never, they're tempering everybody's expectations, pouring water on their fire and being a complete buzzkill, one of the worst ownership groups in sports. That's now going to be gone. Do we now look at the Orioles as a team that could be a perennial contender in the American League and just in baseball in general moving forward? 
I mean, if you have the most optimistic viewpoint, yeah, right? Like, if you are optimistic mm-hmm. that the new ownership is going to get it right, if you're optimistic by having guys like Cal involved, that, that they're going to actually give a damn about competition as opposed to just wringing as many pennies out of that franchise as possible, then, yeah, everything about the team on paper, everything about the team in terms of the, the, the lineup with adding uh, Corbin Burns to the rotation, I'll be shocked if Baltimore's done. Like, there's still more names out there that they might be able to go grab. Everything about this team on paper, specifically the youth, says that they can make a run. Because if you, if you keep this team together, this feels to me – very Atlanta Braves like four years ago, right, when they were really kind of just getting going with that young core lineup they have. They signed all these guys. They got them under under program control for a number of years, and now all of a sudden Atlanta's built an incredible young core lineup. I get the same vibe out of Baltimore right now. And you look at Boston, you look at New York, you look at Toronto, these are aging rosters. They're good rosters. But they're aging rosters, so I think if you want to have the most optimistic view you can about Baltimore, you can say they kind of copied what Atlanta did. They did a good job of bringing guys up through the system to be ready to play Baltimore baseball when they got there. 